LifeBridge, how are you? You guys good? Hey, if you are joining us online right now, we're pumped that you're here. And just real quick, take a second and go ahead and type in the chat wherever you're at in the world right now. I, I think it's really cool. Every single week we see multiple states represented, multiple countries, and I think this is cool. We've had people from every single continent join us except for Antarctica. So if you actually are in Antarctica right now, you are just winning. You're just winning at life. So, and I hope you have a coat on right now. Anyway, last week we set this up. Right now, I believe that this past year has been a reset button for the church in the United States. I mean, with all of the division and the hostility that we see in our country, it's, things are not going in the right direction in that regard. We don't need to recap any of that. But as part of the reason that's happening, is it because the church is present, but actually absent at the same time. Every ecosystem, let me show you what I mean. Every ecosystem has a species that all other life rises and falls on. Scientists call this a keystone species. So if an ecosystem has its keystone species, everything in that ecosystem can flourish and thrive. But if it's not there, then the ecosystem collapses. Last week, we set it up using the example of gray wolves. So wolves are the keystone species for Yellowstone National Park. And when they were reintroduced back into the park in 1995, after being gone for 70 years, they literally transformed the park for the better. Plants, animals, even the rivers were transformed because of wolves and everything flourished. That's what happens when a keystone species is in its ecosystem. And isn't that exactly what the church is supposed to be? Like, aren't we supposed to be the keystone species in every single community, city, region, and country so that everything around the church flourishes? I mean, that's what Jesus said in, in, when he said to the church, he said, hey, you're now the light of the world. You're the salts of the earth. You're a city on a hill. Go be my witnesses. I mean, that's the call that we have. So right now, my question is, why isn't everything around the church in the United States, why isn't everything thriving? I mean, we're here. We're present. There's somewhere north of 200 plus million people that claim to be Christians in the United States. It took 31 wolves. We got 200 plus million. What's going on then? Is it because the church is here, but just not being who the church is supposed to be? I mean, you can put a keystone species in its ecosystem. You can put wolves back in Yellowstone, but if they don't do what wolves do, nothing happens. Is that what's been going on for the last handful of decades in the United States? The church just isn't being who the church is supposed to be. That's why I believe last year was a reset button. It was a call for the church, for individual Christians to be what we're supposed to be, to be keystone again. And what we've got to decide, the question is, all of us as individuals, like you and I as individuals, and then all of us as an individual church, the question is, do we want to respond to that or do we just want to go through the motions? Like Jesus said in one sentence, he said in one sentence, how to be keystone again. He's talking to these two fishermen, guys named Peter and Andrew, and he says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. That's it right there. And immediately they dropped their nets and followed him. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. This follow me, it's an invitation into a story. It's not an invitation into an organization or a concept. It's an invitation into a story, a story that has victory, adventure, transformation, hardship, adversity, ultimately redemption. And it's a story that you and I are not writing, nor could we ever write this story. We can't write this story. It's being written by God. It's the story of the gospel, and he's been writing it ever since everything broke in Genesis chapter three. It's a story that you wanna be a part of. I'm gonna plead with you to be a part of the story. You wanna be a part of it. And the story starts with following Jesus. Now, there's a huge emphasis in our culture placed on leadership right now. Huge emphasis on leadership, and rightfully so. Like, we all need healthy, strong leadership around us where leaders have more character, and that character is valued more than charisma. Because when those two things are flipped, when a leader's charisma or talent or success or ambition is greater than their character, that's when you get problems. Like that's when you see corruption and scandal and abuse and wrongdoing. Like we need leadership, men and women that are great leaders where their character far surpasses their charisma. I'm 100% in on developing leaders. 
growing leaders, men and women that are great leaders that last and finish well. Like I'm, I'm a geek. I'm trying to always kind of grow my own leadership. I'm reading leadership books. I go to leadership conferences. I'm in leadership cohorts, meeting with other leaders to sharpen me and make me a better leader. That's great. We need great leadership. But with this huge emphasis, I think we're forgetting something. Like I think there's something that's going underneath the surface that it's, a, it's an important detail that we just kind of scanned over. And that we were called to be great followers before we were ever called to be great leaders. If you scan through the Bible, the greatest leaders are the greatest followers of Jesus. It's the only, the only thing you see in scripture. The worst leaders are so disconnected from God. Bad things happen when a leader is disconnected from God. I, I mean, I know men and women in my own life that I've met, great men and women that are leaders in and outside of the church, the greatest leaders that I've ever gotten the chance to be around or know, are the greatest followers of Jesus. Man, they're walking with him. And I think the greatest verse for leadership in scripture is Hebrews 13, seven. It says, remember your leaders, the ones who spoke to you the word of God, consider the outcomes of their way of life and imitate their faith. Yes, there are plenty of terrible examples of leaders, both in and out of the church. Like I hate that that's true, but it is. But there's also great examples of leaders. Like people that you can just see, you can just see God's transforming and transcending power in their lives. And when you look at the outcome of their life, you're like, man, I want that, their faith. I want to imitate it. So the question I have written in the margin of my Bible next to that verse, it's the same question you need to ask yourself is, is my faith worth imitating? Like, is my faith worth imitating? I got to check myself on that all the time. I, I am a leader. I teach God's word. So I got to look at myself and say, hey, is my faith worth imitating? Are the outcomes that are coming up in my life, are, are they worth other people considering? And the same is true for you. Because first and foremost, I'm called to be a great follower before ever a great leader. I'm always gonna be a follower. There's gonna be a day where I'm not a leader anymore. But I'm always gonna be a follower and the same thing is true for you. So my followership, I don't know if that's a word or not, but we're gonna roll with it, okay? We just created it. My followership, your followership, it's always gonna be more important than my leadership because in the kingdom of God, the greatest followers have the greatest impact and the greatest influence. And when Jesus says, hey, follow me, what he's doing is he's inviting you into an apprenticeship with him to learn from him, to live like him, to speak like him, to be more and more like Jesus. This apprenticeship with Jesus, it's what we call discipleship. Followers of Jesus are disciples of Jesus and that's what the church is called to do. He says to the church, hey, go and make disciples of all nations. He doesn't say go make converts, don't go make leaders. Those things are great, that comes later. He says go and make disciples. It's very specific. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey, key right there. Teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. Not some of it, not the stuff that you like, not the easy stuff, but obey all that I've commanded you to do. And that's what we wanna do as a church. Like as an individual church, we just wanna grow in our followership. We're gonna roll with that word. Like we wanna be better followers ourselves, better disciples of Jesus, and then we wanna make more followers of Jesus. Disciples that make disciples that make disciples that make disciples. It's multiplication, compound interest. We don't want addition. We want nothing to do with division. We want multiplication. It took 31 wolves to transform Yellowstone National Park. We got a lot more than 31 people in this room right now. We got a lot more than 31 online. What if we took our numbers and multiplied it? And then multiplied that number and multiplied that? What kind of transformation would we see in Northern Colorado? I mean, let alone the rest of the world. Like that's what we wanna do. We wanna see more followers of Jesus that grow into be great leaders for Jesus. The way we say all of that around here is that we, LifeBridge, we exist to introduce people to Jesus, as many people as we possibly can, and then lead them in their next steps with him. Growth, individual growth. But before we can do any of that, before any of that happens, before we can follow Jesus, man, just like Peter and Andrew, we gotta drop our nets. Like these two fishermen, they dropped their nets and those nets, they represented their identity, their income and their influence and they just dropped them. Like you and I, we, like we gotta figure out what are the nets that we're holding onto? 
Like it could be something really good. Like what is the net that you're holding on to? Even if it's great, but it's keeping you from following Jesus. It's keeping you from being keystone again. We gotta ask that as, as a church too. I think by and large, the churches in the United States, the three biggest nets that the church holds on to is the net of consumerism, the net of entitlement, and the net of comfort. Like we live in a consumeristic culture that preaches entitlement and idolizes comfort. We are immersed in that culture, so it is so easy for that to seep into the church. It's such a temptation for every single church to go ahead and grab a hold of, I mean, let's be consumeristic, let's be entitled. Let's be comfortable, it's easy to do that. I've wrestled with that individually myself, all three of them. What can happen is it's really easy to believe that the church is this marketplace for me to consume religious goods and services. Instead of looking at the church as God's community and a movement of God that I get to be a contribution to. It's easy to believe, especially if you have a church background. It's easy to believe that because I've done this, because I've given this, because I've logged this amount of time here, then I'm entitled to get what I want or what I think I deserve instead of looking at the church as, man, this is a movement and people that I get to invest in. And it's really easy to look at the church and say, you know what, above all else, we just need to stay comfortable instead of realizing that you and I, all of us, this is true of all of us, we grow when we step outside of our comfort zones. Like by and large, I think those are the three biggest nets that every church in the United States, life bridge included, are guilty of and tempted of grabbing hold of. Consumerism, entitlement, and comfort, and it makes us go nowhere. Those are nets that are holding us back. But when we drop them, Jesus says, okay, now I got something to work with. I will make you. And this is key. See, what we don't realize or what we tend to forget at times is that your life and my life, it's never neutral. Someone or something is always making you into someone or something. You're never neutral. Someone or something is always making you into someone or something. The question is, who or what is making you into who or what? It's gonna be different for all of us. Jesus says, I'll make you. But is that who's making you right now? I think one of the biggest reasons why we as a church, the church in the US, is not as keystone as we wanna be or as much as we're meant to be, I think by and large is because the culture has done a much better job making disciples than the church has. I mean, we live in this culture that says, hey, truth is whatever you want it to be. Truth is whatever is true to you. Well, what happens when you do that, when you buy into that ideology is you got this person over here and they say, this is my truth. This is truth right here. Great, let's celebrate that. But then you've got this person over here and they say, this is my church or this is my truth. This is, this is what's true to me. Well, what happens when those two truths contradict each other? Because that's inevitably gonna happen. When you have multiple truths, something can't be true if, if the other thing is. That's where the division and hostility comes from. That's what happens when you say to people, you can make truth whatever you want it to be. Like we live in this culture that says you can be your own God. Do whatever makes you feel good. Do whatever makes you happy. And that is the most important thing is that you feel good and you're happy. All that does is just reinforce this heightened sense of entitlement that we have in our culture. It just reinforces that, hey, you should be comfortable and consume things above all else. Everything in our culture is trying to make you into something. CNN and Fox News are making disciples. Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, they're making disciples. Every social justice movement that there is, we've got good ones and we've got bad ones. Every single one of those movements is making disciples. Hollywood is making disciples. The culture and everything in our culture is trying to make you into something. And by and large, culture's done a better job making disciples than the church has. How's that working out for us? Things aren't great right now, are they? I would not describe our current culture, our ecosystem, I would not describe it, this is just me, you can disagree with me if you want, I would not describe it as flourishing and thriving. I would describe our culture as collapsing. It's not like we've been taken out. When you take out a keystone species of an ecosystem, 
It's a problem. Things collapse. The church hasn't been taken out of our culture. It hasn't. But have we taken ourselves out? That's where I'm wondering if that's where we're at right now. And this past year has been a reset for us. Let's get back to being Keystone again. Let's get back to being what we're supposed to be. But underneath every single discipleship strategy that the world puts in front of you, there's three promises. There's more, but there's usually always these three promises. Anything in our culture that will make you disciple, it's promising you quick fixes in life. It's promising you happiness, and it's promising you fulfillment. But the truth is, there are no quick fixes in life. There's no shortcuts. Happiness is fleeting. I mean, you can have happiness for a moment, but it can be gone when you get a phone call. Like trying to hold on and possess happiness forever is like trying to hold sand in your fist. It's just gonna, it's coming out. The Bill of Rights even understands this. The Bill of Rights says everyone has the right to life, liberty, and what? The pursuit of happiness. Key word, pursuit. You're always chasing it. It's fleeting. And there is no real fulfillment. No real fulfillment that lasts outside of Jesus Christ. It doesn't exist. But we get stuck in this. Like we buy into these promises. Man, I'm just as guilty as anybody. This thing over here, man, you're going to get fulfillment. This thing over here is going to make you happy forever. Oh, you know what? If you do this quick fix right here, you can take this little bypass. It will fix this problem in your life. It never works. It just makes things worse. I mean, I've told you this before. Like my youngest son, a couple years ago when he was four, he's just yogurt all over the kitchen floor. Just dropped it all. I mean, that's what happens when you have little kids. And what he tries to do, bless his heart. And remember, you can say anything you want about somebody if you say bless their heart first, okay? <laughs> bless his heart. Like he wanted to help. And he goes and starts cleaning it up with towels, not paper towels, like beach towels. What happens when a four-year-old tries to clean up a mess of yogurt on the floor? It gets worse. It gets far worse, right? That's what happens when we follow the world and we buy into their promises and we hold on to the nets of consumerism, entitlement, and comfort. We go nowhere, we create more of a mess. We can all see this happening in front of us right now in real time. We just let the world disciple us. But besides those nets and those false promises, I think another reason why we don't let Jesus disciple us, why we don't follow him, is because, it's because we've got the wrong motivation. A lot of times our motivation to follow Jesus, to be connected to his church, is because I'm supposed to. That's really inspiring, right? I'm supposed to. If I go home today and tell Kelly, hey, I love you because I'm supposed to, I don't think that's gonna go over very well. Hey, Kel, babe, I'm gonna keep walking you, I'm walking with you in life, not because I love you, not because I enjoy being next to you, not because there's great joy in being your husband, I'm gonna continue to walk with you because I'm supposed to. That feels terrible, doesn't it? You know, a, lot of, a lot of times that's our motivation to stay connected to someone or something, including Jesus and his church, I'm supposed to. And if that's your motivation to stay connected to someone or something, eventually you're gonna walk away from that someone or something no matter how big the consequences are because I'm supposed to is a horrible motivator. But that's the way we look at Jesus. That's the way we look at the church at times, don't we? I'm supposed to follow Jesus. I'm supposed to go to church. Really? Why? Because I'm supposed to. Who said? Who said you're supposed to? It's a horrible motivator. Maybe instead there's far better reasons. What if I told you that there are legitimate personal motivators that will transform your life to follow and obey Jesus and be discipled by him? I mean, he says in John 14, he says, hey, if you love me, you're gonna obey my commands. That's what following Jesus is, it's obedience. It's not filling our heads with knowledge. It's not working everything out with our hands. That stuff comes into play. But first and foremost, following Jesus means to obey. And we hate that word. At least I do. Like, I kind of like, you say obey to me. I'm like, ah, okay, yeah, all right. We like to forget about that word, obey. But can I be really direct with you for just a second? And you know I'm gonna be. I'm just asking for your permission anyway. 
You could know a whole lot of stuff about Jesus, but if you don't obey Jesus, then you're no better off than someone who knows nothing about Jesus at all. Obedience equals freedom. Obedience equals growth. The motivation to obey and follow Jesus is so that I can, like the, the hold of sin on my life, one of those songs that we just sang, so that the hold that sin has is broken. So that I'm progressively becoming more and more like Jesus, just a little bit each day. So that I can be made whole, so that I can be made holy, I can be made spiritually mature by him. That's what we call sanctification. I mean, besides just showing Jesus that I, I do love you, that's, I'm gonna show you by obeying. Besides that, there are a list, a laundry list of reasons and motivators to let him disciple you and not the world. What about this? What about the motivation just so you can be an honorable vessel used for honorable things? I mean, you're a vessel that can be used by God to do some crazy, awesome things that are honorable. Or maybe you could be a blessing in the way that people see your life and they come to Christ because they see your life. Isn't that what Keystone means? I want to be used by God in honorable ways and I want people to see my life and come to Christ. They can see your life and say, wow, man, what, what she's got, I want that. What he's doing, he just seems so solid. What's the difference in their lives, the outcome of their life? They have this, this unpenetrable faith. Oh, they have Jesus? Tell me more, I want that. That's a great motivator to be discipled by him. Or what about just to have more of God's blessings in your life? I mean, this seems selfish and we don't like to talk about that, like wanting God to bless us because that, somehow that seems wrong. I'm not supposed to want that. But God is your father, a good father that wants to give you good gifts and bless you on his terms, not yours. I Man, what, what, if, what if that's my motivation to be made more like Jesus? I just want more of God's blessing in my life and in my family's lives and in my friends' lives and in my church's lives. Or what about the motivator to have greater rewards in heaven? We tend to skip over this, but Jesus talked about rewards a lot. We hit on this in the last series, but maybe I just want greater rewards in heaven too. That's a great motivation. Or what about the motivation just to have a deeper walk with God? That's my biggest driver is I just want God's presence in my life. I want his hand of blessing on me. I want his hand of favor on me. I want to experience more and more of him. I want to hear that little whisper that 1 Kings 19 talks about with God whispering into my ear. I just want more of his presence in my life. So if that means Jesus makes me and that means me obeying him, let's go. Or maybe you have a deeper desire for peace. Is peace not at a premium right now in our world? The more you're made by Jesus, the more peace you're going to get. That's one of the spiritual fruits. Or a greater, a greater amount of joy. There's a huge difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is fleeting. It can be gone with a phone call. Joy, that never goes away. In Christ, man, you've got it for good. It can't be taken away no matter how bad life is. So I want to follow Jesus. I want to obey and be made by him. I want to grow so I've got more joy. Or maybe you just want to obey his commands because you delight in doing what's right. I know God's commands are right. I just delight in doing what's right right now. I mean, those are just scratching the surface. Scripture is filled with motivations and reasons to let Jesus disciple you and not the world. Bottom line is this. Someone who's keystone, they look like that list. Those are the motivations. Not I'm supposed to. So how? Like, how do you look like that? Like, how will Jesus make you to look more like him? Because that's what a mature disciple is. This is as simple as we can come up with it as a church. A mature disciple is just somebody who looks like Jesus. That's it. do not have to be a fancy, fluffed up sentence. Someone who's a mature believer, a mature disciple, looks like Jesus. So how will he make you look like that? And what's that mean for LifeBridge? What's that look like for us? Mainly he'll do this through two things. Engagements and environments. Engagements meaning Bible reading and meditation. Prayer Spiritual disciplines, serving, generosity, sharing your faith with other people, using the gifts that God has given you to bless other people, and you yourself discipling someone else, multiplying yourself. A matured believer, a mature disciple is doing those things, all of them. And the second way is through environments. Jesus will make you through three primary environments, but it'll look different for everybody else, but three specific things that are true for all of us. Number one is one-on-one -on -one intentional time with him, that environment. You cannot get to know someone, let alone be more like them, if you don't spend any time with them. If there's not intentional, consistent time spent with them, you're not going to look like them. You're going to be like them. Like for me, my time with the Lord is every single morning. 
Everybody's different. You just got to find what works for you. Every single morning, I get up before everyone else in my house, and that's hard because I've got small kids. It's also hard because I'm the type of guy, I, I like to stay up late. I also like to, to get up early, and I like to sleep. What I have found is those three things contradict themselves. So I, it takes discipline for me. It takes discipline for me to get up before everyone else, but that discipline has now turned into a delight for me because I'm up early, it's slow, it's quiet, just me and the Lord. I got my Bible, I got my journal that I'm writing down what I'm praying, what I feel like is God teaching me, what, what's happening in my life, I'm writing that down. I usually have one or two other books that I'm reading too, and I've got one really good cup of coffee. Maybe three, depending on how much of a struggle it was to get up that morning. But that's intentional. It's one-on-one, -on -one. it has to happen. Second environment, community. You cannot grow alone and you cannot grow in isolation. It will not happen. It just won't. Jesus had his disciples in community always, always, and at different levels. Sometimes there were massive crowds, thousands of people. Sometimes there was 100 or so in a synagogue or somebody's house. Sometimes it was down to 70 and they, he was sending them out on, on a mission, sending them out to share their faith. Then it got down to just 12 and even at times just three. Jesus invested in three really, really intensely. Peter, James, and John, they were the inner three. Like you have to be in community. If you are not consistently connected in the community, you're not gonna grow, and we all want this too. All of us want to be connected. All of us want to have rich and real relationships in our lives. We wanna have friendships, and in this environment, that's where God will do some of the greatest work on you. Like for me, I'm in, here's, here's how I'm in community. Right now with you guys. Every Sunday morning when we gather a huge crowd of us online and in this room, man, I'm in community with you. I'm growing. Even though I'm the guy preaching, y'all are growing me. Conversations that we have, pushing me, challenging me, encouraging me, man, that's, that's how we grow. And I'm, hopefully I'm doing the same thing for you. We grow together. Something happens when we come together and worship together. Like we're not just going through the motions, singing songs and having some guy come up here and talk for a little bit and praying. No, this is, this is so intentional. Something transcendent happens when people get together to worship the one true God of the universe, Jesus Christ. That's why this has to be a regular rhythm, consistent for you, or you're gonna stunt your growth. Something happens when we worship together, when we gather together. I'm also in a smaller group of guys that from our church. There's 12 of us. We meet on Wednesday nights at somebody's house each week. It's a different house each week. We study the word. We pray. We encourage each other. We keep each other accountable. We tell a lot of dumb jokes. Like we have a good time. I grow in that small group of 12. I also have two or three guys that know a lot about me, that know everything that's going on with my life. They know what's going on with me, they know where I'm struggling, they know where I'm doing well, they know what God's doing in me, they know what God's teaching me. There's a richness there. There's accountability and real vulnerability, authenticity where you can actually grow. And I also have a few coaches and mentors that have invested in me, they're sharpening me, they're pushing me, helping me grow as a disciple, as a man, as a husband, as a dad, and as a leader. I have multiple different areas of community in my life that has to be intentional, you have to seek it out, and I grow from all of it. Any one of those that are removed, including my engagements, my growth is stunted. And then the last environment that he's gonna grow you in are gonna be different seasons and settings in life. Jesus went to all different kinds of places. Tough spots. And part of being his disciple was, what did he say? He said, hey, do whatever you want or go wherever you want. No, he said, follow me. Including into the tough spots. The disciples followed. He went to some places where people were not big fans of his. I don't know if you know this about the gospels, but Jesus had more enemies than he had people that were following him. He took his disciples there. He took them into uncomfortable situations. He took them into storms, like literal storms. He took them into. But every single time, all of that had a purpose. Number one, it was to tell about the kingdom of God, the gospel, tell people the gospel. Two, it was to bless and serve people. For Jesus, that usually looked like healing most of the time. And then three, the third thing was so that he could teach his disciples, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded and all that I've done. The same thing is true for you. If you are not consistently connected to the community of the church, you will not grow. And if you do not follow Jesus into every situation, season, and setting that is in your life, you're gonna stunt your growth. Some of the hardest times in your life are gonna be the greatest seasons of growth. You're not gonna see it in the moment, but in retrospect, you're gonna look back and be like, oh man, gotta see what you were doing there. 
How, oh, I see how you were growing. But you don't just grow in hard times either. The more you mature, the more you grow, the more you're gonna recognize how things are great in good times and you can be grateful. Go to God and say, man, I'm, some, I'm just thankful for what you're doing right now. Thank you for this. That's growth too. When you grow in gratitude and thanksgiving, that's massive growth. You will grow in all situations, seasons, settings, and storms of life if you just follow him. That's where it starts. Bottom line, there are no shortcuts for discipleship. There's no shortcuts for growth. I mean, an acorn doesn't become a mature oak tree in six weeks. And it takes that acorn going through some seasons and storms for it to grow into a full mature oak tree. The oak tree's playing the long game. That's what we wanna do as a church. When it comes to growth, individual growth, when it comes to discipleship here, we just, we just wanna play the long game. Here's how this is gonna look like for our church. So if you follow Jesus' pattern in ministry, there's a specific pattern of how he discipled people and what happened. Starting with the engagement of people, the number of people that he engaged with. At the top, Jesus engaged with, with crowds, big crowds. There were thousands of people that he engaged with at a time. Thousands and thousands of people that he engaged with. Then he broke that down and got a little bit smaller. And he would engage with 100 people, like I said earlier maybe in a synagogue or a house. And then it got broken down even smaller into about 70 people. And then even smaller into 12. And then the smallest engagement was three. As it got started big and got down to three, the engagement level, it didn't change, it just intensified. The smaller the group of people, the more invested Jesus was and the more he pushed into that group. So the greatest number of people, the thousands, actually had the smallest investments at that point. And the investment gets bigger and bigger and bigger the smaller it gets. We wanna follow the exact same model. We have crowds here, right? We have crowds here on the weekend, Look at all those gatherings. That's everybody can be involved in that. Everybody's welcome here. Everybody can get engaged and we wanna engage everyone. Then the next level down as you progress in this engagement level that Jesus pushes on you and the, that the more he invests in you, we wanna go into something called communities, which is the next level down. It's a smaller group of people where people know you and what's going on and you're more intimately connected to a lot more people here. And then the level down after that, the greatest level of investment that Jesus put in three people, we wanna do something that we're calling right now, we're calling them 13-7 groups. Hebrews 13-7, where you got a leader who's investing in two or three people like Jesus invested in three pushing them, coaching them, sharpening them, fanning their gifts into flame, and then calling out what he has for them and going. We wanna take our gatherings and get more intentional into our communities and more intentional into those smaller groups where we're investing in people. Here's what it could look like, possibility-wise. Gatherings, worship, that's here Sunday mornings. We wanna do conferences, maybe a marriage conference or a parenting conference or men's and women's conferences, who knows? Like the, the, we, the sky's the limit. Different kinds of events, worship nights in the parking lot, weekend experience stuff. Then down in communities, we wanna see small groups, serve groups, because everybody here needs to be a part of a serving team. Like this is another way you grow is through serving. That's one of the engagements. And you get into more community that way. Care groups like celebrate recovery and divorce care and grief care and addictions and more and more, more care groups that are specified. Single moms, which is already a pillar ministry of our church. Men's and women's groups, men's and women's ministries. This past week, we already had a group, a group of maybe 12 to 20 hardcore leaders in our, in, our, in our church, women, about talking and brainstorming about what's God asking us to do for women. We wanna do the exact same thing for men. Classes, like what about doing a class for six weeks on how do you actually read your Bible? Because that can be intimidating at times. So let's teach people how to read their Bible. Or maybe there's an eight-week money management course. Or maybe there's a six-week course on apologetics. Who knows? Like we can do anything that we want with that. So we can teach people to obey all that he's commanded to them. Rooted is in communities. A lot of you have gone through Rooted before. That's a great starting point. We can run that play as a starting point. Bible studies. Who doesn't need to study the Bible want to be a part of that? Small groups like the one I have at my house this, this past Wednesday night. We want to do all of that stuff, and it can be even bigger than that. And then finally, going back down to that three or four people where you're just really being poured into and coached and sharpened, and then you yourself are doing that with two or three other people. This is what happened with Jesus. That's all that happened. If you go through the Gospels, that's everything. His model of ministry was this, five things, breaking that down. This is how he started with, with the people that were following him. 
I teach, you listen. I do, you watch. I do, you help. You do, I watch. You do, I'm gone. That's what Jesus did. That's what we want to do. And that's the way we see it going. The more concentrated the engagement, the greater investment. So, the obvious question that I know you're all going to ask is, where are we starting? What's first? And then I'm going to get to the next question that you're going to ask after that. I'm just going to beat you to the questions. I'm going to try. First question is, what are we starting with? I mean, I see all that cool stuff up there. What, what, what are we doing first? Well, our leadership team, our staff leadership team kind of debated this back and forth about six weeks ago. Do we start with a small group initiative? Because right now we have a, a ton of organic small groups that keep multiplying and multiplying and multiplying, but it's organic. That's really hard for someone who's brand new to our church to connect into because they don't know somebody that's got a group and it's, it's hard to do that way. We're seeing lots of invitations, people that are just inviting people to join their groups. That's great, but we need some structure to it too. So how do we do that? Do we start with a small group initiative or do we start with new kind of classes? Not the traditional um, where infinite class where you just keep going and going and going and never stop, but specific topics. Classes on, like I said, apologetics or how to read your Bible. Different things like that. Do we start with classes or do we start with groups? And we came back to the same problem for both of them. The same problem that we had for both of them was, as a staff, we're looking at our church. We need more leaders to step up. We need more of our church to own the direction of our church and where we're going and lead this. Because right now, if we started a small group initiative, we'd have a hard time filling out. We, I know we would have far more people that would wanna be in a group because we hear it every single weekend but I don't know where we'd put them. We need our church to step up and lead. Same thing with classes. Who's teaching? There's people here that can teach. There's people here that are already leading, absolutely. But we need more, because we have more people every single month coming, more people wanting to get connected. There is a hunger, and I believe this to my core, there is a hunger right now for honest, authentic growth in our country, even if people don't know what it is. There's a hunger for the gospel. There's a moment right now. I think we have an opportunity. There's a window going on right now and I don't know how long that window is gonna stay open, but we need to get after it. So instead of starting with a group initiative, instead of starting with classes, we're gonna start with this. We're gonna start with leadership training. So this month, at the end of this month, we're gonna have a two session leadership training about here, here's how you lead a group. Here's how you facilitate a group. Here's how you teach a class. And we need you to sign up and be a part of that. If you consider LifeBridge home, maybe this is your next step. If you love Jesus, if you love seeing people meet Jesus and growing in Jesus, you're ready. Don't be intimidated by leadership or facilitating something. You don't have to worry about that. You just have to be available. God's not looking at your gifting or your experience level or your resume. He's looking at your availability. If you're available, he's gonna make you. I'm gonna make you fishers of men. So sign up on that website. There's a link on the screen right now. Sign up to be a part of that, that training. Two sessions and then we can start unleashing you to lead different things in, the, in, in our church. And then we're gonna start in the fall, more of the things that I showed you on that list. But what I didn't wanna do is, I didn't want us to fall back into a consumeristic model where we started putting out different kinds of programs where everyone can just say, what's next for me to be a part of and consume? So the next thing that we're gonna do is for you to contribute. Because that's the culture that we wanna have. Every single weekend you're here, every single week you're a part of our church, I want you to have a bib and an apron on. A bib on, I'm gonna do my very best job every single week to feed you as best as I can. Everything that we do in our groups or classes, feed you as best as we can. Have a bib on ready to go. But at the same time, have an apron on, ready to serve, ready to lead. That's how you grow to look more like Jesus. What we are not going to be anymore, we're not gonna be a staff-led church anymore. We are going to be a church-led church a staff-directed church. I think this is something that I need to repent of. Because a lot of churches in the U.S. that I'm connected to, and I was a part of this for the last 10 years, is what, what tends to happen is staff just does everything. And that stunts your growth. That takes you off of the playing field and puts you on the bench. So why wouldn't you consume? Because the staff's just doing everything. That's wrong. That's a mistake that I've made. So from now on, the staff will direct us. Here's where we're going. Because we can't go in 99 different directions. Even if there are 99 great things, but if one's going this way, one's going this way, one's going that way, one's going that way, what's that do? That just pulls the church apart, right? 
But here's the direction we're going. Everything that we're doing is about introducing people to Jesus and leading them in their next steps with them, helping them grow to look more and more like Jesus. As a church, all of us, we're gonna lead that. Next question you're gonna ask is, when's all this gonna start? Besides the dates that are already up for the leadership class, when's the rest of this gonna start? That's up to all of us as a church. We will go as fast with this as you want us to go. If we don't step up and get into the game, this isn't gonna go anywhere. It's gonna stall out. But as a church, if we step up and all take on this ownership together, we'll start moving. It's not gonna happen in three months. It's not gonna happen in six months. But a year from now, two years from now, what could this look like? We could just be churning out disciples in our church that are going out and transforming everything because now we're Keystone again. And that will happen as fast as you wanna go. I want to go six months ago. I want to go right now. But we want to do this the right way. And I'm hearing a let's go right here, which is awesome. It's awesome. But we'll go as fast as you want to go. So right now, here's your next step. Go back to that link. Sign up for it. Be part of the class. Grab us in the lobby at the New Here section. If you've got any questions at all, sign up there. But let's get in the game so the mature people so we can mature people because right now the gospel is urgent. Jesus is coming back and eternity is a really, really long time. Let's not sit in our hands anymore, all right? Let me pray for us. God, thank you so much for your truth and you inviting us into your story. I just ask that you you would help us respond, that you give us a courage and a tenacity and a hunger and a faithfulness to follow you and be obedient to you, and that our church would be stirred to glorify you, to introduce people to your son, and to disciple people that disciple people that disciple people. I want to be a part of that. That's the purpose you've given us. Thank you for that. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, have a great rest of the day. Enjoy the mountains that returned, and we will see you back here next Sunday, all right?